Morgan. <laughs> Can you get it so our faces are next to each other? Uh, you got the wheel behind you there, frames. Nice. I think I try to get a little of this in there. There we go. That's kind of cool. Well, you doing the raw thing now and sending messages through your hat? <laughs> Yeah, well, I got I got the shades too, so I can do. Uh... Welcome. It is the Frequencies Podcast, and I am joined by my guest Sean Walbridge. Sean, how are you? I'm good, man. I'm here yeah. with my dog Scout. What's your doggy's name? This is Scout. Scout. Just lost, okay. Yeah, she, she just lost her best friend last week. I had, uh, I had to put her other dog down. So. Uh, good thing she has has you there. Ow. I had quite an epiphany this afternoon. He's on to something. I don't know what it means, <laughs> but I noticed that when... I'd love, to hear. I'd love to hear. So when I had the reading with Richard Beaumont, which is what, October? He said a lot of stuff. Like it was four and a half hours. And at one point, and I don't remember where we were in the body graph, but he was kind of working root to top. So I do actually need to just go back and see it because the reference just flew over my head. But a couple of times he said, like, here's a depth charge for you or something, right? And it was his choice of language. and. Um, that, you know, have you ever considered wearing sunglasses? But didn't elaborate, right? It just kind of leaves me with that. I'm like, well, of course I do. If it's sunny, I might wear sunglasses. No. And uh, I never quite understood what that was until like the last week or so. And I'm not sure what tipped me off, but I realized that, um, yeah, when I talk to people, my eyes have an intensity that I never thought was there. And it intimidates people or something or triggers them like kind of depends what the message is that's coming from me and uh but i what do i think it's a bunch of stuff going on i'm definitely um the more i dig into what's going on with me and the speed that my brain seems to go like ahead of what my body can stay up with um i think i'm definitely would have been on a spectrum adhd autism like the works right and uh there's a sort of speed where my brain is going so fast that i think my eyes are darting around gathering data and that at times can be, I don't know, comes across as sketchy, maybe, you know, like just like, or, and I've noticed when I've been on video, my eyes are shooting around. I mean, I, I get a great vibe from you, but uh, yeah, I mean, I it, it might be, it could be something like that. It could also be, I know um, Brayton is inner vision and he wears sunglasses a lot and inner vision people, like I have a friend who's uh, inner vision and he'll be talking and he'll he'll do this. And then he'll say, no, it's not that it's, and he'll like choose the word. Like he basically closes his eyes, turns his head back, accesses something internally. And then suddenly he has it, it's there. And he can kind of, um, so maybe, you know, have you looked much into the design of forms, the design of mammals? It's, it's quite fascinating. A little bit. Um, I know she's a projector. The other really? dog that just passed, that we couldn't actually determine her birth date. So with this little girl's a projector. It's so. kind of rare for there to be a, a projector animal, but um, you know, it's it's they're, they're mostly reflectors because there's just less possible <clears throat> activations that could make a projector. You know. Uh, that's interesting. Because I know, only yeah, have fifteen gates. So only fifteen gates actually activate for mammals. <clears throat> The other some in oh, sorry. Go ahead. If well, if you know what line uh, she is, I mean, you need a pretty precise birth time for that. <coughs> Not I, I'd have to dig it up. Yeah, yeah. But um, I I love <laughs> looking at the lines because, for instance, we don't have a birth time for my friend Mike's cat Nancy, but we're pretty sure she's a second line because you can kind of see in the character. And a second line mammal, they're very afraid. They're very fearful. And they'll hide, but they'll hide in plain sight. They don't know you can see them. So Nancy will go hide under a blanket. It'll be like this bump on the bed. You know, they'll, you, you can see Nancy. She doesn't think you can see her. She's under the blanket. And, you know, uh, apparently the second line mammals get eaten the most. They're the, the most common prey. So second line animals. Okay. Yeah, third line animals always getting into stuff, you know. First line animals take a long time to trust, that kind of thing. Fourth line animals are super friendly with everyone. Ah, uh, Scout's Scout's adorable. She's probably fourth line. <laughs> I'm guessing uh, yeah, fourth she, line. She's here for a reason, that's for sure. I, maybe if we take a break, remind me and I'll dig out her stuff because I'd like to know. If you can tell me a bit more about that, I'd be very curious. 
I do know that when my, my wife and I uh, get into any kind of argument, she'll actually stand between us. Like we'll be lying on both ends of the bed. Not, a, not an argument, having a chat. And she Maybe also- she's a fifth line. Maybe she's a fifth line <laughs> savior. You know, that, that's like Lassie. Lassie's mm-hmm. gotta be a fifth line, you know, comes in to save the day. It's no, it's more disruptive. Um, in fact, if my wife and I hug in the kitchen and my kids would testify to this, she will try to jump between us and separate us when we're hugging. I see. So more like the jealous, but getting between not, not like, Maybe. Hey guys, chill out, but more like, Hey, she might be a former girlfriend in another incarnation or something. <laughs> so <laughs> it's like, that's a good question. If, if you've been, been a human before, can you come back as an animal? Does that, is that how that works? I mean, it's a good I, question. I, well, when my other dog passed the other day, uh, a couple of people had said, you know, her work here is done. And uh, when I read that, I'm sure I've read that in the past with other animals, but it was just like, whatever. And this time I was like, no, that makes sense. Sorry, old girl. And you know, I like she wow. was a fighter to the end. So, yeah. So, yeah, if she's a projector, does that mean I have to recognize her? <laughs> I think like, so. Are, well, and it's that- are you a former girlfriend? If she's not invited, that, uh, you know, <laughs> she's... Uh... <laughs> Right, and that you have to recognize and invite. I mean, well, there are plenty of animals that get recognition. They're the animals that prance around for these animal shows and so on. And mm-hmm. <laughs> you had a question um, before we got on the dogs. What were you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I wanted to hear what you've been up to since our last chat. We had such a fun. You were on the very first ever Frequencies podcast. Thank you so much for kicking it off. And uh, it was a wonderful chat. I still have a page full of notes here from our first chat because we didn't even get to all the stuff we had to talk about because we just had so much to talk about. Yeah. Uh, well, since we, yeah, since we connected, what was that about three weeks ago? I, uh, I've learned how to do hypnosis, like actually hypnotize a few people and witness things I can't unsee during this amazing hypnosis class, which is, now, is absolutely- is hypnotherapy or is this uh, like, what is the purpose of this hypnosis? But all the people in that room wanted to be in service to others. So much as um, some of them I think are more the, what, I, what would I say, the conventional route, doctors or whatever, that they're adding it to their portfolio where it's kind of just, uh, I don't know, a little less woo. And then plenty of woo people. I was the only person in there with a mohawk, but there was a, a it was a colorful lunch for sure. Um, everyone wants to help someone else, and pretty much all of them came from a place of trauma of some kind, and I had either had it done for them or seen it done and just saw the power in it. So, mm-hmm. yeah. and I was already exploring hypnosis and uh, like self hypnosis uh, through the form of quantum jumping and NLP and and other stuff. So it just kind of was a I, I want to hear more about the hypnosis, but you know, you mentioned this uh, in a previous chat. Can you tell me a little bit about quantum jumping? Well, what is sure. quantum jumping? So uh, I don't know if Bert Goldman coined it, but I think he was called the American monk. And uh, he, I forget the story. He tells it in one of his uh, videos or audios, but basically he just brought a bunch of uh, things back from out East and incorporated it and kind of his, the last thing I saw about him, because he, I guess he died five years ago, or so about their votes, and his whole portfolio of videos and stuff was bought by the folks at Mind Valley. So if you're on there and have a subscription, it's just right there. It's Quantum Jumping, Bert Goldman. And he basically takes you into a hypnosis. It's definitely a hypnotic not a trance using various methods that I actually learned this week. Like he has his own style. But uh, you basically go into this med- self-induced uh, meditation with intent. Uh, part of it is he actually gets your, to touch your tongue to the roof of your mouth. I'm not sure quite what that tells the body. He called it uh, the baga, I think. It, and then it, once you it's a circuit. I, I actually do that habitually throughout the day. I, I learned, mm-hmm. um, you know, that there's a natural resting place of the tongue at the top of the mouth, and when you do breathing like this, uh, there's some kind of. I think there's two energy circuits. One that goes from the tip of the nose down the spine and the other that comes up the front of the body to the tip of the tongue. And when it touches the palate the, uh, at the top of the mouth, I think it completes the circuit. Okay. Well, that makes sense. Cause it, and he kind of says like, it, and it's kind of turning into a habit when I'm trying to be focused or with intention and as a very busy mind, I, I actually, it's still not a very good habit, but it does. It kind of calls me to attention. Right. So, so you do that. And then 
uh, he gets you to relax. It's it's hypnosis, meditation, frequency. It's all that you know, quiet the body and mind. And then um, you know, once you <clears throat> get to that state, you're then going to have um, some time with your your self subconscious. It so usually gets you to walk through a portal, and then you're now meeting with yourself, you know, your future self in some sort of state. So the state where you've solved some business problem or, you know, some like whatever, whatever thing you're wanting to solve. Right. And what they might call in, in um, you know, NLP having resources. I, I know that the mm -hmm. term resources is used a lot in NLP. And, and if there's certain resources yeah. you don't have access to, maybe you have access to resources in the state. Yeah. And they're right there ready to be grabbed. So um yeah and i had some success with that i i caught some behaviors and people that i didn't like asked some questions saw them turn sheet white because my i either didn't have the courage to ask them the question before or didn't realize it was bugging me as much as it was saw a shift in them and you know resolved a couple of business and personal relationships that weren't going to work for me so um and that was just from my subconscious going like dude ask so and so a question <laughs> Um, didn't even actually tell me what question it was. It just left me with that as a message and uh, served me well a couple of times already. And that so this was, this was already kind of your background before learning hypnosis. And recently you then, was it a class? Was it a seminar? Was it kind of an intensive workshops or what, what, what education did you receive? Yeah, I haven't done quantum jumping in probably a year, but it definitely raised some curiosity. That got me into NLP because I was really interested in that. It got me into actually watching human behavior, which proved to be useful too. Um, then I built this Rockstar Bingo platform, right? It's, it's a side hustle, well, becoming my my daily <laughs> income now. But uh, I, I built this product for playing music bingo. But during the um, during COVID, um, a fellow in Toronto, he's a, a entertainment hypnos hypnotist. And he was doing music thing because he was stuck at home and he's a he's a guy that likes to engage with people so he was using the app we got became friends um then he actually flew it to victoria we did we combined our live band music bingo show with him so he did an opening set as like hypnotism and then hypnotized a couple people in the crowd so when we started playing music bingo uh you know one guy thought he was playing the, the guitar solo he had a woman convinced that my drumsticks were out of tune and i was like there's a video of me like exchanging drumsticks with her and she's like like listening to it and trying to fix my drumsticks and give them back to me. And so once I saw that, I was like, oh man, there's something more this. So then I got into NLP, I got into the quantum jumping. And then I said, hey, Richard, like, where should I go to get NLP work? And he said, go to the, see this guy, uh, Mike Mandel. He's a hypnotist in Toronto. And he's been going, like he's 70 and he's he's an eccentric genius. And uh, it was awesome. So we learned, like I watched him do all sorts of crazy things and then the so people this was a with. mike mandel um like a multi-day event that he put on or was it a training yep. or oh wonderful wonderful five days in toronto and i of course wow. signed up for it and was excited and then didn't do any prep so went in totally green and which probably was better for me in the end but uh by by tuesday afternoon i a couple people i had under a light hypnosis and by friday i had one guy that um it's called the ellsdale technique i think and uh, I almost nailed it, but I basically was able to pick his arm up and it would just stay in the air, pick his leg up, put it in the air. Like they had people like, you know, doing selfies with people as they're using them as human mannequins. And wow. was, so there's a fun part to it, but it was just like how much control. I, and, and when he came out of it, and of course you always plant a positive suggestion. So I, I forget what he wanted, but you know, it's, it's usually dealing with things like procrastination or one more, more energy in the morning or whatever. With great and, uh, power comes great responsibility. So if you're going to, you know, use mm -hmm. people as mannequins, you also have to give them something that they can use. As yeah, well. totally. Actually, when that guy, when Richard was here in Victoria, um, that's where I got inspired by because he was scouting the room before the show and was listening to people's conversations. And he overheard one guy talking about wanting to quit smoking. And so even though the guy wasn't in the show, wasn't hypnotized or anything, he was actually sending suggestions to the guy while he was in the chair. And I was like... That's pretty cool. I and you could actually that. like sneak I, attack giving yeah. someone the gifts, so right? Fantastic. So. Well, mm -hmm. um, have you ever seen Darren Brown? He's a stage magician, stage entertainer. Wonderful. Uh, just just a wonderful series he's done. I used to love watching Darren Brown. He's a neurolinguistic programming practitioner and a hypnotist. And he'll do these incredible things like that where the whole audience is getting suggestion without realizing it. He'll present a mystery. He'll leave all the clues all night long. And at the end, 
he will give options to reveal the clue and then he'll say you all know the answer and people are like what i don't know the answer and then he's like is it this one they're like no is it this one they're like yeah and they're like how do we know it's this and then he'll like you know like reveal like some very complicated answer that they were primed to choose very interesting stuff. I mean, he did a lot of, uh, he would use a lot of NLP tricks. Like he would go on the subway and then he would uh, ask people what stop they're getting off at. But he would say, now what stop thinking about it now? What stop are you getting off at? And that would mess them up because he would be telling them to stop thinking about it, you know. And typically mm -hmm. while he touches their arm or does something that kind of throws them off guard. There's, of course, are you familiar with the work of Milton Erickson? He was a famous uh, therapist. We were taught some of his methods. So Mike gets right into all the history, and that was a name that definitely came Well, up, Milton so. Erickson would do the, the handshake method, where he would shake someone's hand, which is such a normal thing where you close the loop. He wouldn't let go. He would shake mm -hmm. their hand, then he would take their wrist with his other hand and say, now looking at your hand, tell me what you see. And they would just be totally gone, you know, <laughs> within the first 10 seconds. So, I mean... Um, and he would also do a similar kind of thing where he would be talking to the audience and putting them into a mild trance and notice who was closer to the trance. There'd be a lot of skeptics in those days. This would be the 1950s. So you'd have these scientific, scientific materialist kind of rationalist people. I don't believe in hypnosis. It's all fake. And they would show up and then he would get them in a mild trance, invite them up on stage, do the handshake trick. Pretty soon, 20 minutes have gone by and they're waking up and going, what, what just happened? And people are saying, it turns out you really like to dance the Calypso, you know? <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. He did. I mean, he, he pointed out, it, he made it all safe, though. You know, like everything about it was super cool. Like he's like, well, you can yeah, do a lot I mean, with I, this I, stuff. But, but that's what I found, too. I went to a hypnotherapist named Jan Revere out of Seattle, Washington. Amazing, amazing hypnotherapist for about four years. And really, you know, every now and then uh, you you hear some someone, you know, I think Richard Bandler got kind of a bad rep. The guy who did neuro-linguistic programming with a couple other people, he kind of founded it. He got a little bit of a bad rep. Um, but overall, I mean, people like Milton Erickson or obviously Jan, the guy I worked with, I mean, they're, they're healers and doctors, really. Uh, they're just, ah, uh, Scout's really happy. You know, they have hypnosis for, for you know, animals, actually. They, they really do. You can even get animals into a, obviously not with the, the auto-suggestion of words, but with sort of Pavlovian teaching and so on. I mean, that's what a lot of good trainers do. They kind of communicate with mammals in, in a different state. So it's really just working with altered states of consciousness, you know, putting people in that's them, right. meeting them at that level, communicating with the unconscious, asking the unconscious to answer the question. Mm -hmm. yeah. So yeah, uh, tell me a little more about this this event. I mean, five days with a living legend of hypnosis. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah. Well, part of it that drew me in is he's got some YouTube videos because he also does graphology. So he was talking about uh, people's handwriting and clues you get from that. And I'm just I'm lately fascinated by people and how they behave, and uh, you know, just different characteristics with a Y or a G or how you how rounded your ends are and stuff. And so that was kind of what sucked me in. I think in the end, but yeah, I just kind of went there with no expectations other than I was going to try to focus, which is challenging for me. It took till about Tuesday afternoon before it kind of kicked in. Um, well, I, I would actually say, uh, if I can just share your chart here for a minute, if you have no problem focusing, it's staying focused on something. <laughs> <laughs> because you focus, you take it all in, and then you move to, to something else with it. Actually, this came up last week with um, my good friend Mike, um, who you may have seen on some of my videos, and who you'll be meeting. By the way, so excited you'll be joining us for HDHD 2023. Woohoo! <laughs> uh, guest speaker there, very excited about that. But Mike has a hanging nine, and he talks about it a lot. And he kind of said that as he deconditioned he noticed um, how his nine operates. I can't really put it in the poetic words he used, but it was something almost like um, like floating and like landing on something and then taking off and landing on something else. Very smooth transitions and very smooth context switching where it's not that he can't focus, it's that he focuses 
for exactly as long as he needs to, which could only be 12 seconds. And then he moves to something else and it could be for 32 seconds or something like that. Mm-hmm. He said it very well. It was in a recent, uh, a recent convo we had, so it, I can't really do it justice, but um, I definitely want to ask him to kind of, you know, elaborate on that because he was just talking about how it doesn't have to be this jarring thing of I can't focus. It's more like I allow my focus to move from thing to thing as it needs to, to kind of, I think he was, he was saying it, it, it's almost like a bird that perches and then takes off again and perches somewhere else. So. That makes so much sense, but it also ties in with the whole ADHD spectrum thing. So I've been following this guy out of us, I think Australia is like the Aussie, Aussie or something, autistic Aussie or I'm, I'm not sure, something like that. And he was talking about how he doesn't trust um, alarms and clocks because it let them, it let them down once and all it took was once and he never trusts them again. So even when he would set a reminder, like, cause I want to be in flow and I've got 15 minutes, he would set the alarm, but he would actually not trust it. So he would check it every minute or set three alarms. And I realized like, I do that all the time. So the point I actually can't get focused because I'm so worried that I'm going to miss what's coming up. Um, but lately I've been testing that. So I was at the hospital today just to get some blood work done. And I was waiting for the queue, like where you're waiting to be called up. And, uh, I had a little THC and some mushrooms, so I was just sitting there like really zoned out and really into reading this article, that one about sunglasses I sent you. And um, it turns out like three people came up and tried to interact with me. And I just, because of my sunglasses on, they couldn't tell that I couldn't see them. And I was just so zoned out. I've never, like, they were like, you were like gone. And I was like, really? I was just reading an article. But they didn't want to, because I have the headphones in too, so I couldn't hear them. And, but just I recognize, like, I felt so safe in that flow. So I was like, ah, they're going to come get me. And sure enough, they didn't. So, because all they threw me out. So, there's like a trust to being in flow. Um, I don't know if that comes from just being like, like the guy was saying, like being let down by, you get let down a couple of times and you just don't trust it. And then your mind is so busy trying not to forget to, to multitask, to yeah, jump trying tasks. to remind yourself. I mean, that's something, um, you know, we, we both have undefined head and Ajna and that's something where, um, I've just kind of, you know, with this open, open head and Ajna here, um, I've, I have a couple activations, but I, they're still undefined for me. And it's been something where at times in my life, kind of earlier in my life, I would try so hard to remember and be constantly reminding myself and pressuring myself to remember something. And now the moment I get um, an appointment, I put it on my calendar. The moment I get, you know, I have to do something, I write it down. It's like the moment, it's like, I can't keep anything in my head because there was something I realized once. It was when I, this was before human design, uh, maybe it was 2014 or so. I was going to the grocery store and I remembered to pick up something and I didn't go get it right then. So I kind of pushed it away. And then a minute later, it was like, no, 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 you need to pick up, you know, orange juice or eggs or, you know, whatever it is. And then I put it away again. Then I remembered, I was like, okay, if I don't get it right now, I can't, claim that I didn't remember because I did remember. And I, and then I started thinking and I was like, I actually remembered twice. Then I was like, actually, how many times is it going to remind me? And I had this mental image. I sometimes get synesthetic mental images, almost like a record player needle, like reading the record and wearing down the groove. But it was almost like a brain synapse or a brain. It was like some like neurons in the brain. And it was kind of like, Every time you remember something, it's like, it like reads, it like scrapes off a layer of this embedded information. And after you've scraped it off enough times, and after you've reminded yourself enough times and not done it, it's gone. And you're not going to get any more reminders. And I was like, wow, the amount of reminders my brain will give me is finite. I better be sparing with them. I better Mm -hmm. not have it be reminding me at the wrong possible time. I don't want to be laying in bed remembering what I have to do. I want to remember what I have to do when I'm there. And if I remember, if I pre-remember too much, it's scraping off the, the reminders so that I don't get a reminder later. So then I was like, okay, there's like the initial information coming in. There's the embedding, the encoding, then there's the reading it. I can't just infinitely read the information like 
it's kind of like there's no free reads you know what i mean like even a hard drive will eventually fail if you just keep reading that disc over and over a record will eventually turn to static if you keep playing it and mm -hmm. i kind of had this mental image and so that at that point i was like okay i need to stop reminding myself but i mean of course what is the thing reminding myself? It's the unconscious. But I was kind of like, please unconscious, only remind me when I can actually take action. Because if you remind me too soon, it's not helping me remember later. It's preventing me from remembering later. Because I was reminded too much ahead of time. I don't know if that kind of relates to what you're talking about a little bit too, but that was kind of my, this was maybe 2013, 2014. I mean, of course, it's the question of how do we how do we get the reminders when we really need them? And I think yes. that's something where NLP or hypnotherapy could actually help because it is working with your unconscious to say, hey, I don't want my unconscious to, like I just saw Shane Mouse live, Shane Moss, the um, great uh, comedian, psychedelic researcher. He was saying he doesn't smoke a lot of pot anymore. He, he does a lot of other things, a lot of psychedelics. But he doesn't smoke pot because he's like, basically it just gives me every reminder all at once. I'm sitting there and I'm like, I, I don't need to remember to do my taxes. Like I'm gonna do them. Like I don't need to remember like that in three weeks I have a doctor's appointment. Like my calendar will tell me, but he's sitting there going through every last thing that he could forget that he has to remember. And it's like this kind of layer of hell for him. So he's like, I just can't, I just can't do it anymore, so. Well, there's that paranoia from the THC. <laughs> it just yeah. triggers all kinds of fears. It's good because it makes you take notice. So that's, that's why I kind of blend. Like I just have a little bit of that. It's more CBD, CBG, and then just a tiny bit of THC. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's, that seems to be what's helped me settle quite a bit. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So tell me a little more about this, this hypnosis workshop. I mean, so by the end of it, you were practicing. I mean, that's pretty cool. That's very hands-on. He teaches you techniques, you use them. Mm. I mean, that's great. Well, so you practice you every single, like every 15 minutes or so, there was some new technique or thing. Um, and then you would practice on someone new in the room. So it kind of forced you to meet everybody, which was cool. So everyone at practice, you didn't get comfortable uh, with any one per particular person. So I noticed they were doing that. Um, before we took every break, he would sit down and give us a metaphor and tell a long story. But the whole idea was buried in the story. It was a hypnotic statement, you know, building confidence. So it was very, very clever and very, very well done. And then his crew and he, people that have been there before come back as masters. And so they're there to like do another level of it. And just the depth and quality of these people was amazing. So, yeah. And so, that is so cool. um, yeah. yeah, there's a woman there that was afraid of snakes. Really sweet lady. And uh, part of the whole system is because uh, he, he talks about hypnosis and how well, it's definitely uh, disregarded in some places or it's, it's, you know, witchcraft or whatever, whatever you want to call it. So, but part of it is like, um, capturing before you help them and after because he's actually had people and seen people that refuse to pay because they don't believe they formally had an issue so wow. right so he's so he's like starts his session off with um so what's your issue and she said snakes like she's definitely afraid of them like even discussing them so he said you know like a garden snake and she's like oh and then like an anaconda and she was like practically fell out of her chair and just mentioned right so this is like a 9.8 out of 10 and he's like so great like when you like to get to a one or a zero and so he does his thing and uh take like, this particular technique took two passes but after the first one he he did his thing she was down with what number you have now is a four and so uh he's like okay well, that's good let's well, maybe we can go a little deeper and he got her down to a zero to the point where he was like what do you think of snakes now and she's like well they're kind of cute they're you know, a little slippery um they might might be found around the garden he's like what about an anaconda and she's like ah oh, it's in a whole other country okay a whole other continent like they can't hurt me and then one of his assistants came up behind her and he had taken his belt off and he was like holding it like a snake <laughs> as he's creeped up beside her and she turned she was like ah oh. like he you know he's she, he surprised her right he came out of the periphery but the fact that he's holding this stake in his hand didn't budge and so i was like oh that's amazing i love so, that i love that <laughs> Yeah, it shows well, the power I, of the mind. So I, I mean, I, as I mentioned, I went for four years to a hypnotherapist and it really, really helped me. It was as a teenager and I was going through a really hard time. And uh, for some periods of time, I'd go every week. Other times I would kind of come back a month later or something like that. But it was, uh, it was very, very helpful. And we did some, I actually went to a number of NLP practitioners, mostly on Revere, but I went to a couple others as well. And they were all good in their own way. They would do inner child work. They would kind of, 
do things similar to um, more recently I began dabbling in EMDR, which uh, mm -hmm. is kind of, I had heard about it when I got into tapping and, and also tapping is a form of self-hypnosis suggestion and sort of um especially positive reinforcement right yeah like, i guess positive at the reinforcement end. and yep. it also kind of somehow having similar to emdr having these physical components can really help program uh the unconscious and but with emdr there's a lot of work where you kind of go back to early childhood trauma but you're you're experiencing it but you have these techniques that that you try to sort of depotentiate that trauma similar to what you might do in neurolinguistic programming where you see yourself on screen in a movie theater and then you're also sitting in the theater and then you're also in the back of the audience watching yourself sitting in the theater watching yourself on the screen then you're also in the projection room watching yourself in the back of the audience in the front of the audience on the screen and you have the ability to pause it to stop it i mean it gives you this kind of safe way to almost it's passenger consciousness right it gives you the experience of passenger consciousness where um it's not you having that experience it's the experience is happening and you're this watcher so. yeah he that's what he did with the with this woman was sort of the the movie theater thing he had a different take on it um slight different take but it's the same thing like seeing yourself in the worst case, in the most recent case, and then re rewinding it backwards and make it make it smaller, make it less, and to the point where you're not, you know, can't visual your, visualize yourself as that person that experienced that event. So I mean, that's yeah. something Super that was cool. so powerful. Learning NLP for me was just the the submodalities. Like certain people are very visual, certain are very auditory, certain are more kinesthetic, and so on. And finding what your dominant submodalities are, and then being able to tweak those so that Someone might be scared of spiders and they're a very visual person. And when they describe the spider, it's like a zoomed in huge thing. And all you have to do is like shrink that picture back to a more reasonable size and they're no longer frightened. So, mm -hmm. or, or someone else might be very kinesthetic and you have to move it or, you know, things like that. Um, the swish yeah. technique was, of course, one of the classic NLP techniques. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but that would be switching from a sort of triggering experience to one that has been adjusted or kind of modified in certain ways certain submodalities are changed so that it's going from color to black and white or or and mm -hmm. so on and then you often replace it and then bring the new one into full focus as well it's kind of another way of doing That's it right. so yeah very cool stuff I, yeah i love this kind of stuff i mean to me this is very cutting edge i mean it was cutting edge back in the 80s and 90s and it's still cutting edge it's still has kind of remained in this very, um, yeah, I, I loved the Robert Anton Wilson book, Quantum Psychology. That was one that I got really into. I think it was, it was written in the eighties. And um, I don't know if you've heard of Robert Anton Wilson. He's the other Ra, cause his, you know, initials are R-A-W. So he would okay. say Ra. So we have Ra Uruhu, of course. And then there's the other Ra, Robert Anton Wilson. And uh, I was a huge fan of his as a teenager. I read his Cosmic Trigger series and, you know, his fiction works. And then I read a lot of his nonfiction as well. So. What, so what did he write again? Quantum what? He wrote Quantum Psychology, which talks about NLP. He also wrote Prometheus Rising. It goes into Timothy Leary's Eight Circuit Model of Consciousness. He wrote the Cosmic Trigger series, which are nonfiction mixed with fiction to keep you on your toes. He wrote the um, Illuminatus trilogy, which is all about kind of secret societies and it's, it's all fictional, but it's kind of like historical fiction. Um, the Schrodinger's Cat trilogy, that has one of my favorite introductions of any book. This will just give you a little sample of his wit. Uh, he was a really funny guy. And uh, he said, he starts the book by saying, um, there was a planet, um, a, a planet, a blue planet, you know, the kind of like, you know, third rock from the sun kind of thing. And he goes, this planet was called Terra by a tiny minority. You know, there's a, there was a, a basically he says the, you know, the, the most popular, the, the most populous being on this planet were these six legged creatures called bugs by this tiny minority that despised them. <laughs> Right. But this tiny minority had an outsized influence on the planet. They called themselves humans. And they and he talks about how, you know, kind of tells the story of humans and says, uh, 
and they trained canines that they call dogs and they had a symbiotic relationship where the dogs taught humans canine qualities such as loyalty and dignity and honor and the humans taught the canines human qualities such as fear and laziness and neurosis and you know and he has this whole uh, he just frames everything from such a bird's eye view i mean he's definitely a a psychedelic writer if we could if we could say that i mean or a informed by psychedelics so i'm going to have to check that out i think the word raw raw means messenger right so that's maybe that's my next uh, message. Thank you. It's definitely right up my alley. <laughs> well, and you know what's interesting? So you were just in Toronto. Ra Uruhu, born Alan Robert Krakauer, was born in Toronto and actually lived there until he left Toronto for his human design journey. I think it was Montreal, actually. That's what I thought I read. Oh, definitely. Definitely. Well, uh, he, he at least lived. Them, but... he, he may have been born in Montreal. He lived in Toronto at the time that he mm -hmm. left for his human design journey. Um, right, because he did, he did work at a jazz club, which sounds much, I mean, I'm sure they have jazz clubs in Toronto as well. Mm -hmm. When he was 15, he, uh, he worked in a jazz club and that's where he first started smoking cannabis, 14 or 15. Uh, and he was born, I think in 48, 49. So that would have been pretty early. But, um, the story of when he was in Toronto is fascinating. He ran a media company, had a bunch of employees. And he lived on the top floor of this office building where they all worked. And the entire floor, he had everything painted black. And he was this media mogul, right? It was in 1983. And uh, he just, so he ended up, he started getting what I, I would probably call bouts of depersonalization. He would just suddenly kind of have, feel one of these bouts coming on. And he'd be standing there and he would just kind of be overcome by just this weird detachment from, you know, the sound would change, the acoustic mm -hmm. environment would change. And he was concerned and worried. And every day what he would do is he would drive his Cadillac uh, and he would go to pick up cigarettes and then he'd go back to go up to, to the top floor of the office where he lived. And he would always leave his, his car running. He would leave this, you know, Cadillac running, go in, buy his cigarettes, come back out. Well, one day, right as he's going into the little bodega corner store to buy his cigarettes, he feels one of these bouts coming on. He sees himself buy the cigarettes, pay the money, his car's running out in the parking lot, and he goes out the back door. And for the next half an hour, hour, he just, he's walking, just walking in downtown Toronto. And he's just thinking, well, my car's running. And he starts thinking, I wonder if someone's going to steal it. I wonder, finally, he's like, did someone turn it off? He just keeps walking though. And he's like, what about, maybe it just ran out of gas. Like, he's just like, what happened to my car? He goes back to uh, the office, goes to the petty cash box, gets out about $800, which is what they had. Takes that and his ID and a small satchel, just a bag that he had, goes to the airport and just leaves his entire life behind. His entire life. His entire life. That that was, uh, the, the whole story is actually told in one of his early lectures and it's been transcribed by Jan van Denberg. It's a fantastic story. Uh, we gave it as a gift to the attendees of the High Desert Human Design Conference last year. Uh, it was actually Jan's gift to the attendees that he had transcribed this and we sent it out to them, so. But in any case, uh, I mean, there's more to it than that. It's a fascinating story, but that's how he ended up in Ibiza. He ends up going on this journey. Um, he goes to, I think, Brussels at one point, and he gets out in Belgium, and it just smells terrible. And he's like, I'm not supposed to be here. So he goes right back on the plane, gets, an air, gets a, right back to the airport, gets a ticket, and goes to Amsterdam. Gets off in Amsterdam, and he is staying at a hostel, and he's freaking out. I mean, he's still like, what happened to my car? Like, they declared him legally dead. You know, he vanished. They declared him wow. dead. And uh, he's in Amsterdam at this hostel, and he meets this guy, and he's like, where should I go? And the guy goes, I just came from Ibiza. I just got off the magic bus. It's leaving tomorrow to go back. And he's like, well, I can't say no to going on a magic bus. And he says, but I just want one thing. I'm dying for some cannabis. Could you give me some cannabis? So the next morning he wakes up or he, you know, he goes to breakfast and he comes back to his room. There on his bag, sitting on his bed, is a rolled 
joint or spliff, you know, from this guy as a gift. So he takes the joint, he's like, yes, puts it in his bag, gets on the bus to Ibiza. Well, he makes it all the way to the Spanish border and they search him. He's dressed all in black, he's an American, he looks suspicious. They find the joint and it causes this huge ordeal. And, but eventually he just, they're like, okay, where are you going? He says, Ibiza. They end up saying, okay, we're not gonna charge you. You shouldn't have tried to bring this across our border. We're just gonna throw it away. But also you can't get to Ibiza. You only have US dollars. You need to change the money. So they change his money for him and end up giving him like two or three times as much due to an error or kindness. And they end up giving him all this money and sending him on a boat to Ibiza. And when he gets off, he doesn't really know where to go, except that the guy in Amsterdam told him, go to Sandy's bar. <laughs> and so he tells the taxi, I want to go to Sandy's, which is still there, by the way, still there. <laughs> and he goes to Sandy's bar, he gets off and he walks in. And there's about eight people sitting in there and they would become his friends who would be there at his funeral. Wow. I mean, he literally just relocated from Toronto didn't know where he was going and found the friends for the rest of his life somehow. That's a defined G center. That's a magnetic monopole. And that's also <laughs> how he got his name. When he walked into Sandy's, he never went by Rob before that. He went by Alan Robert Krakauer, but he liked, he used the pen name Robert because his mom always wanted mm. a Bobby. She wanted to call him Robert and he didn't, his dad wanted to call him Alan, you know? So when mm. he gets into the, the bar, <laughs> he walks up to uh, the bar and the guy goes, um, hey, well, you know, what's your name? And he's going to say Robert. And he goes, my name's Ra. And the guy goes, Ra? And it's like, it's stuck. And then the guy introduced himself and he said, well, my name's God. And when I die, I'm taking you with me. <laughs> I've heard that part. That's, and that's a mind tickle. As soon as you hear that. that that's a like, good, that's a nice one. Yeah. <laughs> it's like when you die, are you dying or? It's, yeah, I died when I die, with me. You with me. Yeah, I'm God. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you're Ra. Okay, well, I'm God. Nice to meet you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so anyway, thanks for, you know, obliging that little story there. But um, that's awesome. I, I'd only heard little parts of that. Well, there's but, more uh... to it. He ends up in Israel at one <laughs> point. I mean, it's very fascinating. I mean, he, he really was searching. He was looking all over. So, so I've had a um, recurring childhood memory forever. There was a TV show um, in the late 70s early 80s called the rise and fall of reginald perrin and it was like a show uh that has been repeating in my mind for like the last 35 years but it basically is this guy that was successful in london and um you know by all accounts he was happy except he wasn't so one day he takes off his clothes walks into the ocean decides to disappear uh and then i forget how it happens but he basically comes back to town and um intends that he's now this reginald perrin guy a new person and he ends up like dating his former wife as a new person. He thinks he's got them all convinced he's someone different. Meanwhile, they all know that it's the same guy. And whatever he does, he's constantly successful. So he starts a new company called Grot. And at Grot, they make square hula hoops and like all sorts of things that nobody needs, right? And he can't help but be successful. And that like I watched it when I was so young that it, I don't really remember much more than that. And I even tried watching it recently and it wasn't really my thing. But like that has stuck with me. And when I was, before I went and had my, thing two years ago and had my mind reset that was like a, this tv show just kept replaying my mind like i think i was just ready to like i'm just gonna walk in the ocean and try you know try over it wasn't like just die but it was like i need to escape so right and yeah <laughs> starting in a different way i mean that's what happened to Ra. i mean he changed his name he mm -hmm. ended up in ibiza with his friends who would be the friends for the rest of his life really um a radical uh, realignment um and, you know, th there were news articles about him going missing. He was a known person. People were on payroll and they just stopped getting paychecks. You know, it was. Uh... <laughs> so yeah. that was in, in uh, Toronto. But you're absolutely right that he, um, I recall he was born in uh, Montreal. And that's where he, you know, as a youth um, worked actually as a janitor or helping out at a little jazz club, which I just thought was the coolest thing. And mm. that's where he was introduced to cannabis. Yeah. He also claimed to have done LSD around 5,000 times towards the end of his life. I mean, but by the end. So that's quite a lot. Yeah. He did most of his experiences solo because apparently when yeah. he was a teenager, I think he was 16 years old, if, I, if I'm remembering correctly, 
when he did psychedelics with a good friend and the friend actually died and it was a huge mm-hmm. tragedy. And because of that, he didn't want, you know, it's so, such a trauma that he didn't want to do psychedelics with someone else again. And so he did them alone. And so he was really um, kind of a solo tripper, if you will, for much of that. I mean, of course, later he would do them with people again. And there are stories of him. Uh, he was an early ketamine experimenter with John Lilly. Mm. Well, the first time he did ketamine, uh, I think at that time it was injected because John Lilly was experimenting with it with dolphins and they were friends in you know, Ibiza, where, where Mr. Lilly lived, uh, Dr. Lilly, I guess. And Ra tried it for the first time. And I think, I think he explained he went out to, um, he had a favorite place to sit in the ocean where he could kind of sit on this throne of rocks. Mm-hmm. And he sat out there and experienced it and came back. And they asked him what he'd experienced. And he said, uh, he, he experienced God and that God smelled like compressed intelligence, which is such a wonderful description. <laughs> and that was kind of in some ways. What does that smell like? <laughs> yeah, the smell of compressed intelligence. And that was kind of the beginning of Ra's mystical phase where he went from being this scientific rationalist capitalist businessman media mogul you know to um having a newfound understanding so well, i was the squarest square until two years ago when i was a drummer that never smoked a joint and never smoked a cigarette I was a good boy and then two years ago now i'm yeah i solo all the time and uh it's life-changing Have you ever seen the movie uh lucy i haven't Worth is it good so it worth yeah so well i mean when i it's funny my facebook status popped up like six months ago when I first watched it. So I think I want to say that's eight years ago, maybe 10 years ago. And it's got Scarlett Johansson in it. And, you know, at the time I was like, hot skank turns into USB drive. Like I was like, I can explain this movie in five seconds. Hot skank, it wasn't like that. It was, but it was like, you know, basically she was just this. She plays a robot or a cyborg. No, no, she's just a woman that ha- thought she had a boyfriend. And then all of a sudden she's involved in this kind of like drugs, mule smuggling thing where they put drugs in her stomach. But they, they basically knock them out, um, put a big bag of this blue stuff. They never call it LSD, but it's basically something. And they put it in her stomach and she has to uh, be a mule to go around the country, at which point they'll operate and take it out. But she's also oh, wow. told her like, if she doesn't get there, they'll kill her family. Like it's really- so It's not a dark, cyborg. Right? It's more like a crime thriller. Okay. But while she's kind of waiting to fly, this guy kicks her in the stomach. Like he tries to assault her and she fights. She's lippy as Scarlet would be. And uh, he kicks her in the stomach and it opens this bag inside her. And so basically, and then the, the narrator, narrator is Morgan Freeman. So, and he's this uh, neuro guy and he keeps talking like basically as he's kind of narrating, talking about how we only use 5% of our brain and uh, what if we use so it's more of it. Like, it's almost like a limitless situation where she kind of, her superhero origin story is that she's this drug mule who gets like the world's biggest mega dose Oh, I've got to see it now. Please. Yeah, that sounds wonderful. I, and it, I gotta... You know, like, I think they called it Lucy because Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds, right? That's the whole sure. LSD thing. And yeah, like by the end of it, she's controlling TV and, and coming through people's electrical circuits and like controlling their mind. And I've done LSD enough well, that, now. That, that reminds it's... me of the film Lawnmower Man. I don't know if you ever saw Lawn, Lawnmower Man. That was a classic Stephen King. I haven't seen that one. Mid-90s uh, cyber horror um <laughs> Yeah, that's a really fun one as well. But I'll have to watch it. I, I'm a big movie buff, and I, I even like kitschy B movies. All of it. I'm I'm happy with. It's a, it's a bit of column A, column B, but it it opened my eyes, and so I have my stack days where instead of cannabis, I'll have my little quarter tab, and those are very productive days. <laughs> but but they're also just high intensity, so I have to pick the right day for that. Mm-hmm. Well, very cool. Very cool. Mm-hmm. Well, I have a few notes. Um, so, yeah, I mean, is there anything before I go into my notes that you wanted to chat about first off the bat? or? Uh... I'll tell you one more story from the uh, hip- hypnotism thing. Sure. So basically, it was kind of a self-hypnosis thing. And I've been meaning to actually record this um, just to give it like a bit of a testimony or thanks for that course. But I had a pain in my the left side of my foot so I, my dog would move i'll show you oh he's good <laughs> so right there this side of my foot about 13 years ago i had a pain in it and you know i i thought maybe i heard it playing softball and never really knew what it was 
but it was so sharp that if you were to scree- squeeze the side of my foot, like across the top, I would punch you in the face. Like it was that kind of pain. It was bad. Uh, cat- yeah. It was bad, right? And I and I couldn't replicate it unless I either squeezed it, which is rare, or leaned that way. And that would just be like a lightning bolt to my head. So very bad, went to specialist, uh, CAT scan, x-rays, everything. And eventually the doctor said to me, uh, we don't know what it is. You're just going to take uh, Advil for the rest of your life. Which I learned is basically a spell L in itself, right? Like just like hypnosis, like when they plant that suggestion in your head. And I just kind of accepted that for a little bit. Then uh, so I just, it was just painful forever. And then I want to say six months ago, I was digging into my metaphysical uh, anatomy, which I, which I think I've told you about, and kind of got into the, the trauma of foot pain. And then, you know, using that sort of, what they call it, the sud scale, I took it from a nine pain down to about a five. But I could never get it lower than that doing my own work, which was kind of like a bit of cannabis and sitting with the book and like whatever mental memory came up. But this week, this guy, David, it was his turn to practice on me. And they do this uh, technique. I, I forget what it's called, but basically the idea is that you get your hand imagining it, it's cold. So he gets me to into a Zen st- or a quiet state and a trance state. And then I'm picturing my hand being cold. And he kind of says, like, imagine like your hands inside a snowbank. And once you've got that cooling sensation, you're going to send it around your body. And everywhere, every body part that you send it to, it's going to double in its intensity, right? You're always planting that suggestion. So I don't remember where he sent me, but I'm sure it was like to my shoulder, to my other hand. But then eventually, because I had told him about my pain in my foot, that was the, that was the target. So he sent the energy down to my foot. And basically the idea is your subconscious will know how long it's going to take for you to realize that that pain doesn't need to be there anymore. And so I don't know how long it was, but from what I can tell from most, it's 30 to 90 seconds. And then, you know, nod when you, when your subconscious knows it's done, he'd nod and then he'd bring you back out of trance. Pain was gone, like hundred percent. And I actually went out that night with a buddy to see a, a, a drum uh, clinic and I'd taken an Uber there. And I'm, I noticed that my left foot, my, these three toes are wiggling. Like they hadn't moved in 12 years. Like they were basically always compensating for the sore side of my foot. And all of a sudden my uh, toes are like dancing. They were kind of foot. holding the tension to try to keep the pain from being activated. Interesting. Yeah. It was super weird. And I just noticed it. Like I was talking to the, the Uber driver and I was like, that's really weird. That's a new sensation, right? Nothing I had in forever. And then as I'm walking with my buddy, I realized that now my hip hurts. And it's because my body is adjusting to my foot walking properly for the first time. All of a sudden, I wasn't shielding or protecting. It wasn't like basically, I guess it was making like a claw with my foot, right? So now my hip hurts because like you want to go to a dentist and they, they put a filling in and then they grind it and then they get you to bite. And the whole idea is to try to get your bite back. And I don't know about you, but I've left the dentist a few times and it's hard to tell if you got it right because your mouth's frozen. And you're leaving like, it's just not right, right? And it's about five days of just irritable. Mm. And yeah, then eventually kind of you just settle in. Yeah. yeah. So I was going through that for like two days. And uh, it's been a week. Pain is totally gone. Um, went and played softball the other night. Like I was running differently. I was moving differently. I played pickleball and was like all of a sudden doing things I couldn't do before. Like I, it was just free. So, wow. and that was just should like fully confirmed. Like that one was all my head, right? You can break your leg, you can break something, but that metaphysical, like, and, and, you know, in the book, it's definitely, I know for sure it was tied to some sort of trauma. I don't remember what it was at the time for a foot, but I couldn't tap into that subconscious low enough, low enough, but I knew, I guess, knowing that I knew that I got halfway there, that I just needed this friend's help to send you know, that subconscious energy where it got into the shadows and the weeds that I haven't uncovered yet. Right. I'm sure I'll get there anyways, because it's what I do. But um, yeah, it was awesome. So I, yeah, basically my foot is a different foot now. That is wonderful. Wonderful. And more evidence of how incredible hypnosis can be. And for anyone who hasn't tried it, I highly recommend it. Uh, it's something that helped me a great deal as a teenager and I still remember, I mean, I still occasionally do self-hypnosis techniques or I fall into a trance oftentimes on walks or, yeah, it's just a very, very powerful uh, tool to be able to know um, that that we have some, it, it can help with the feelings of helplessness. I mean, with the feelings of why is my own body or my own mind kind of, you know, against me and it's it's not against you. It's doing what it can to help you, and it thinks it's helping. Uh, 
That's why I always liked when we would do NLP, um, we'd ask, you know, what is this trying to solve? And can we find a different way to solve that? Or is there a, it, it all has a purpose, right? It's like, it can seem so random and illogical, but these are mechanisms that are, um, they're, that are purposeful. And uh, mm -hmm. it really shows us that purpose is something that exists outside of the conscious mind, that it's some of our hubris to think that we are the sole arbiters of purpose in an otherwise purposeless cosmos and so on. And that even <laughs> extends to um, the unconscious, that the unconscious has uh, its own sense of purpose and so on. So mm -hmm. well, this has been a great talk. Let's take a short break. And when we come back, I'm going to dig into some of these notes. I'll be back in a moment and uh, we'll just keep going for part two. Okay. This is awesome. For this I guess part, that could work. I'm doing this. <laughs> It'll be easy to find later. Okay. All right. And we're back. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, let's take a look at, uh, at this image you just sent me. And this is Scout. Wow. 5720 projector. Very, very cool. And uh, personality sun in the sixth line. So, um, a sixth line dog, that's, I mean, a role model, a real role model of individuality. I mean, it's an interesting question. Does the sixth line, is this the aloof dog who just doesn't really care what's going on? You know, is this the, uh, it's like, what can we really say about the sixth line? I, some of them are a little bit easier to interpret. You know, you could think of a first line as being very, territorial and kind of fundamentals, you know, like it needs time to establish its foundation and so on. And of course, the, the second line doesn't know when, when you can see it, kind of like we say about second line profiles, dancing naked with the, you know, windows open and so on. And not, uh, uh, you haven't heard that one? Is that something you haven't heard? You, you seem surprised. No, I've heard that. <laughs> no, I'm just watching her go by and I'm trying to picture her. I see. That's not what I see. Yeah, like it is kind of hard to, how do we deconstruct the sixth line? You know, it's easy to think of the fifth line as the savior, the kind of uh, Saint, you know, Bernard that has the med pack in the Alps and comes up and saves the people or the the dog that helps, you know, the police or, or, or you know, in these different situations, the sort of fifth line dog savior. And the fourth line dog okay, is easy wait, to imagine I gotta, as well. I got to cut you off there because just as you said, Saint Bernard, she jumped up and kind of like she's a golden doodle, but that was a St. Bernard walking towards me like it had the thing under its neck. So it's almost nice. uncanny, the timing of that. I was like, I've nice, never seen her do nice. that. So, so I think she answered well, the call. She's a fifth. But yeah, it's interesting. I mean, it also, of course, um, well, yeah, 42.6. I mean, we have to take into account other things as well. Like um, she actually has a personality sun in an activated gate. Whereas many mammals will have a personality sun that doesn't activate a gate. So it, it's right because there's only 15 gate activations. Right. Oh, Interesting. yeah. Yeah, 15, right. Because it's showing here, it's showing what they connect to. But it's, of course, these are not activations, these are just what they connect to in humans. So really, huh. the only gates that can be activated are, you know, these, these gates. And so um, if a mammal is born when the sun is in gate 10, they don't have the personality sun, um, you know, it doesn't activate for them. So it, it does make you wonder if, if that, you know, animals that have more personality, what we would say like, wow, that, that animal really has a personality, very recognizable personality, could be because the sun was in one of the 15 gates they actually have. Mm. Kind of an interesting question. Now, I knew a dog that had the 515, and that was the funniest because this dog, Pickles, if you've ever known humans with the 515, they're really on their own time frame. I mean, you're always leaving, and they're wanting you to wait for them to get ready, and it's been like an hour, and you're like, are you going to come or not? You know? And that's what this dog was like. I mean, I've never seen a dog that 
was digging a hole in the backyard when the owner wanted to take it on a walk. Usually dogs are right there by the front door just waiting to go on the walk or so excited. This dog, it was always like, Pickles, Pickles, where's Pickles? Because Pickles had the 515. Pickles wants to go on a walk when Pickles goes on the walk. You know what I mean? So That's interesting. I got the 515 in Chiron, and Sean wants to Sean around when Sean wants to Sean around. <laughs> it's kind oh, of, yeah, that's... Uh... And that's sort of like new permission I've given myself, but it, I only got that in... I always wonder about that with Chiron, too. Does it truly just mean that that just kind of arrives right your... like because you don't have so you're saying your personality and your design chirons make 515 yep the whole channel appears that's so interesting that's so interesting yeah, yeah. i i wonder because i mean we don't use them as activations but it is an interesting placement and in some sense chiron heralded the nine centered age i mean there are many astrologers and people have thought that the discovery of chiron um i think it was 1979 <laughs> or that kind of heralded the, the the new age and the age of healing and self-help and of yeah i mean obviously chiron is a very very powerful archetype so yeah. it was my wake-up call for sure i mean i think we talked we talk about that last time like 46 is when i had the stomach surgery that was my body preparing for it 50 is when i went and saw the shaman it was actually within like two weeks of being there that i was or two weeks of my chiron is when that arrived and then um I had a reading with Lavina Archers. It was a Chiron reading, and she kept talking about this dude with an arrow in his hip, you know, like this half man, half horse. And I took it so literally. I was like, ah, that's my hips have been fucked since you, you know. And so I was like spending all this time with CBD and like stretching my hips and I kind of aligned my body. And I've definitely had all sorts of Kundalini energy and all sorts of stuff, but it really is with uh, when I'm uh, doing my trauma stuff with cannabis my it's all about hip movement my hips are just gyrating and i can feel i can taste the fascia as i release it it's very wow. interesting wow <laughs> so, but well, i took I it so strong, literally yeah so I, I definitely have a strong connection to chiron because i have a i think i mentioned this in the last video is a, a grand uh air trine with my personality son um at two degrees libra trining Chiron at two degrees Gemini and my, my midheaven in the beginning of Aquarius. So I definitely can relate and Chiron is relevant to me and also being on the cross of healing. So mm. these are all very important. Uh, I did you're going to have to help me with the whole astrology thing. I'm like such a new, I know what you're, you know what you're telling me, but I, none of it makes any sense to me yeah, so far. I was I'm talking to Mark off. Germain just a couple of weeks ago about astrology because he was wanting to get into it, uh, having been in human design for 16 years or however long. And I was telling him, uh, there's a really great short essay by Richard Tarnas called Astro, um, introduction to archetypal astrology, the astro intro. And, uh, you can find it online. If you look up Introduction to Archetypal Astrology, it really is just so nicely condensed and it just describes the planetary archetypes. And it's pretty much impossible to read that and not recognize something about humanity and life and narrative and story and, arch you know, just all the archetypes, myths, legends. Like it pretty much just paints the picture of just what life is like and the psyche and how we understand things. And it's, it's really very uh, colorfully described and very visceral even in, in how he describes it. Like he makes you understand what Venus is about more than just hearing, oh yeah, Venus is about beauty and art and aesthetics. He doesn't describe things with these dry conceptual terms. He was a close friend of a man named James Hillman, uh, who actually was a student and then kind of broke from Carl Jung. So hmm. he was a post-Jungian. And Hillman uh, had his own project. Hillman was a projector, but a big part of his project was um, doing away with the stuffy conceptual language to kind of achieve an imagistic way of talking that conveyed more information. So um, when Hillman talked about the conceptual versus, he basically, he used the images of spirit and soul. 
And he would describe how the language of soul, the language of the psyche that actually communicates to the psyche, that actually kind of gets through in a different way, uh, it's not like standing on top of a mountain and, you know, looking out um, uh, as a cartographer would, measuring everything. And, you know, instead you have to go deep into the valleys um, where the, the syrupy rivers flow and the mist clings to the the you know mountain side and so on and and he would use these images to describe and you, you kind of get what he's saying in a very deep way much more than him just saying you know one is analytical and the other is evocative or something right he because that would still be keeping it in the language of spirit in the sort of technical jargon so that's something i find with tarnas is that he's he takes a note from the the James Hillman school, where he really um, issues a lot of overly technical language and instead goes deep into the poetic and the mythic language. And it's just really, he's just an amazing thinker. They both are. I would say James Hillman is up there as kind of one of my favorite. James Tellman? So it's Introduction to archety Archetypal what? Astrology. So, so Astrology. Tarnas was a student of Hillman. Um, so for, for, for learning astrology, I recommend, it's a short essay, it's online, Richard Tarnas, An Introduction to Archetypal Astrology. Then if you're interested in more of Tarnas's work, his book Cosmos and Psyche is incredible. It is quite dense. It tells in detail the last 500 years of Western history through the lens of astrology. So he talks about the world wars and he talks about different political movements and different movements in music and arts and culture and all of it through the lens of the archetypal conditions of that time in history as expressed by the planetary cycles. So, I mean, it's, cool. it's, it's really good. Yeah. I, I think I'll be onto that soon enough. I'm still <laughs> going down these other rabbit holes, but it, that astrology is calling to me. I mean, it's it's worth at least understanding the archetypes um, because obviously in human design, we also know the planetary archetypes and it's nice to be able to contrast. I mean, Ra didn't say, okay, in human design, we know that the planets are really like this. What he said is build a personal relationship with the planets, build a personal relationship with the planets through your hanging gates. So every time you have a transit, um, you know, every time gate something goes into gate 35, you have a chance to get to know gate 35 because you have a hanging 36. And hmm. every month you get to know the moon for 11 hours, it goes into gate 35 and you get activated and your solar plexus activates during that time. And then you might have longer ones. I mean, if Pluto goes into gate 35, you're going to have a multi-year transit or Neptune, right? Even yep. Venus or Mars can last, you know, uh, 10 <clears throat> days, or if the nodes go in, it's, th it's, you know, three and a half months and so on. So you really are given all these opportunities to get to know the planets every time something transits gate 49, every time something transits gate 39, every time it transits gate 30 for you. You, you mm -hmm. not only experience the transit, you get the flavor of the planet making that transit. So I have hanging 12, and I remember when Neptune was in 22. Um, it's in 36 right now, but it was in 22 a few years back. Well, Neptune veils, and it's really hard to see what's going on until it leaves. You know, it's doing something, it's activating. I had a very, I had multiple years of having a defined solar plexus through Neptune. So obviously it was doing something, but it veils. It's very hard to know what it's going to do. And... Mm. I remember after it left, I remember feeling so lucky because my whole breathing had changed. My lungs had changed. So much of 1222 has to do with breathing. People who have activation here often have problems with speech impediments. I did as a child, and I had to go to a speech therapist for quite some time. And oftentimes speech impediments are really related to breathing impediments, not knowing mm -hmm. how to breathe not knowing how to breathe and talk and how to alternate between the two and not knowing how to start speaking after you've been breathing or to start breathing after you've been speaking or all sorts of complexities there. 
And Neptune really helped a lot of that. So I remember after Neptune left, I had the distinct mental image of Neptune as this doctor who would kind of put up one of those doctor's screens, you know, how, how they're doing something behind the curtain, you can't tell what. Like they're doing surgery and they just put the, put the curtain around. And that the whole time it was there, and I felt so lucky because I was like, I'm lucky that in my lifetime I got surgery from Neptune. And I'm also <laughs> lucky that Neptune is considered a great debilitating force by a lot of astrologers. That's because they're, for most people, it probably is, because they don't have strategy and authority. And so my kind of premise is that with strategy and authority, you don't take action where you otherwise would. And so I have a mm -hmm. hanging 12, Neptune comes along and activates 22. If I didn't have strategy and authority to surrender to waiting to respond, I would be taking all sorts of action by initiating. This is a manifester channel. It's a channel that initiates mostly out of anger and it initiates by separating and changing and saying, I quit and I'm doing this and I'm screw that and I'm leaving and I'm going here. And you know, it's, it's a really, because I didn't do that every time I had the urge to quit something and I resisted that urge every time I had the urge to change something and I resisted that urge, I sort of gained the benefit of what Neptune had to offer by allowing it to continue operating on me. Because if I had initiated, it would be discharging all that pent up, all that pent up energy, and all of its operations would be thrown away as a sort of energy that I'm casting off through my actions. So I remember feeling really lucky and going, wow, I got to have this two year surgery done on my breathing and on my articulation and my speaking and my way of expressing myself. And I'm going to carry that with me the rest of my life. Whereas if I had just initiated every time it got uncomfortable, I would have lost any potential benefit. So that was my, my hmm. sort of personal relationship with Neptune. Uh, so there's no substitute for that. I mean, you can't read an essay and then go, okay, but, but I will say Tarnas is the best astrologer I've found. One of the best. Jason Hawley is also incredible. He doesn't have any books, unfortunately, not yet, but he does have some incredible YouTube videos and he's just an amazing, <laughs> eloquent kind of drawing from evolutionary astrology and also archetypal astrology and, um, uh, I just love these thinkers. He also has a bit of a James Hillman. Uh, he's versed in Hillman and, and kind of draws from that, that mm. world a bit. So. Yeah, it's super interesting. It's, yeah, it's next. I love that you have these four, you, you have all four verbal gunslinger. I think we talked about this last time. You have, they call these the verbal gunslinger channels. There, there might be more, but at least these four I know are called that. Yeah, you've said that before. So tell yeah, me, tell it's me like what that means, guns. and I'll tell you what it's. I'll tell you what it means for me. But you tell you have me two guns means, in your hands and two guns in your feet. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Just... Is is one of them like an old Uzi, like Nazi Uzi, where when you shoot, <laughs> you just like <laughs> like a stormtrooper, you just miss everybody. <laughs> That's what it feels like at times. So, <laughs> so which one's that one? <laughs> Although I've learned to control. One. I've got a. There's a sniper scope on it now. So now it's about timing, picking my nice. spots. But <laughs> yeah, that's been a discovery for sure. The other one is the my 46.4 in uh, Pluto and Detriment, both in design and personality and trying to, like I've I, <coughs> kind of, I'm starting to recognize what that is. So it, when you read it, I forget exactly what it says in the Ching, but it's like, it basically my interpretation is, um, I, I stand on the shoulders of everyone else and take credit for their work. Uh -huh. And honest, honestly, that's not, I've made a life of not doing that. But what I realized was I've gone through a life of no one ever saying thank you to me. Like no one ever. It's, it's maybe it's the intensity. I don't know. Maybe it's the confidence, but people just sort of assume that I got my shit together. And as a three, five, I'm, <laughs> that's not how I feel about things. And so no one ever actually says good job, Sean. So I've never done it back because why bother? So in the last couple of weeks, I've realized, oh, fuck it. I'm just going to like be grateful for everything. Even when I'm like, I, yeah, I could have done that and I could have done it better. <laughs> it just sounds terrible, but, but now I do it. And then people like, gosh, like it's weird. They're just like, and, and then I get it back, which is great. So it's like, oh, 
Shit, well, you have this. Say thank you all the time. <laughs> you have a completely open ego center, and what Ra says about the completely open center is without any activation. I mean, it's very fascinating. Um, he he says that basically they can go beyond the binary of the not self, where usually the not self, like I have a completely open solar plexus. Usually that's just gonna like your undefined solar plexus not self is going to avoid c confronting the truth. And what it's going to do is when the truth comes along, it's going to have these fixed ways of avoiding that confrontation until, of course, you're in, I mean, now you're in the human design experiment, so it's not going to do that anymore, but, or at least it's not going to, um, you know, you're going to be able to resist that sort of urge because it's typically only through initiating that you can avoid truth anyway, by changing the subject or by change, you know, if you're really just waiting to respond, something gets really uncomfortable. The solar plexus goes, oh my God, I want to avoid truth. You don't make a decision because you didn't have a sacral response, right? So you just wait and let it be uncomfortable and that's that. But, um, mm -hmm. you know, as to not self, <laughs> that 36 is going to basically have a crisis every time it's going to be a crisis when and it's going to initiate because it's part of an initiating channel and it's going to say okay i'm avoiding this truth i'm going to go start something new that causes a crisis so i don't have to deal with that truth it's almost like um you know it's easier to deal with the crisis than it is to deal with the actual truth there and that 55 is going to have its own fixed fixed way too where it's going to uh, as the not self anyway um you know, it, it'll have its its fixed reaction of moodiness or something where it's like some difficult truth comes up and it responds by being moody or it responds in a certain way of, of kind of, uh, uh, it, these are strategies to avoid the truth. But for me, I have a completely undefined solar plexus, no activation at all. Mm. And so in a way, what, what Ross says about the totally open centers they're too dumb to even know how to do the not self theme. Like it doesn't even know how to avoid the truth. Sometimes it just accidentally, you know, says the truth because it's just so unaware, but that they have this amazing, almost idiot savant sort of potential to them and that they can become incredibly wise. But the difficulty is they have to learn even basic things. Like uh, he says, the undefined solar plexus doesn't even know how to feel. And he doesn't even mean how it should feel, just how to get in touch with feeling. Feeling is such a foreign language to it that I've had mm -hmm. to learn, okay, I can slow down because slowing down allows the feeling to emerge. Oh, okay, here's a technique I can do to get in touch with my feeling. I can write about something and that'll make the feeling come out. I can listen to a song. Like certain things that are kind of obvious to other people aren't obvious to me. And so I think the mm -hmm. equivalent for the undefined ego would be it's it's not even that it's almost like if we think about the ego as threat, it's like 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 you were telling me earlier about about the sunglasses and realizing some people might be threatened. And just, mm -hmm. it's like almost not even realizing. Most people would go, oh yeah, if you come across really intelligent and really kind of amped up in a certain way, people might just be threatened even by that or something, right? But with a totally mm -hmm. undefined ego as a blind spot, it's like, wait, people are threatened by that? I didn't know I was threatening. Like, how did I threaten you? Like, all I was trying to do was share my opinion or something, you know? But it's kind of, mm -hmm. but then at the same time, you gain all of this ability to learn because you're learning stuff that other people take for granted, you can learn it so deeply. And uh, mm -hmm. it's what really is a, a powerful thing when you see this much openness. I mean, um, in the rave psychology materials, what Ross says about it is that when you have this much openness, particularly nothing pointing at it, because you see how you don't have 37, you don't have 45, 25, 44. What Ross <laughs> says is that uh, this is a theme of denial, projection, and blame. Because basically it just feels like it feels like you got to do it all on your own because you can't <clears throat> trust anyone else to do any of this ego stuff. Nobody else keeps their commitments. Nobody else follows through. Nobody else has the willpower. Nobody else has the courage. Nobody else has the creativity or the entrepreneurship. Nobody else has, will give me the support or has the ability to support. Nobody even knows how to support. And so there's this whole kind of feeling of just being totally on your own here. And then when somebody mm -hmm. says to you, hey, well, you know, um, you know, you might have something to prove or you might be trying to prove something. And it's like, 
no, no, no. Other people are the ones that have something to prove. I don't have anything to prove. So as the not self, it can be this big blind spot, but it's like a blessing and a curse. They kind of go in, in both ways where I guess the curse would be that it's so hard to see, but then once you wake up and see it, you can't unsee it. And it becomes one of your greatest talents because you have mm -hmm. no fixed not self strategy, if we could call it that. Right, just like mm -hmm. there's a true self strategy of, in your case, sacral response and informing, uh, there's a not self strategy, and that's trying to prove or you know, whereas this solar plexus, it's going to always have a fixed thing it does. It's going to have a fixed story. It's going to have mm -hmm. a fixed way of. <coughs> so. Interesting. Yeah. Um. Hmm. Mm hmm. <laughs> Yeah. Well, actually, this is a good segue into actually, this was actually one of my notes. So in your reading from Richard Beaumont, he talked about the 3420, and it doesn't necessarily or maybe even ever have an uh-huh, uh-uh. I mean, you do sometimes go, mm, or you have sounds, but for mm -hmm. the 3420, it's not about the sounds. No, well, the mm, mm -hmm, like that, it, it goes to my throat so fast, and I, and I just only figured that out a few weeks ago I found a video on youtube and woman was just asking sacral questions and it was like practice so it was like do you like coffee mm -hmm. do you like brussels sprouts mm -hmm. and, and but it was like 20 and i was like training it and that so was useful for you yeah it's the instantaneous it's <laughs> 20 it just immediately comes out yeah yeah so then i uh then i started making i actually asked chat gpt to write a whole bunch of questions fed it into a word document loaded into um Speechify and had Snoop Dogg ask me my own questions, but I randomized them so I didn't know which when it was coming because I wanted to get like sacred responses that were authentic. Because if I'm asking myself questions, I know what's coming, right? Yeah. So Snoop Dogg has asked me in random order, <laughs> in his tone, and I just went through the questions and then got clarity on that. So that was interesting. The other thing he taught me about 3420 was um, like when I get frustrated, like I, you know, I get that first. Uh, state as a manifest generator and anger is next right it comes so fast and it can it catches me off guard like i don't even see it coming and he's suggesting like just pounding uh a countertop or a, a hard table once or twice just to let the energy release through me and uh i tried that a couple of times and boy it was like it just completely settled me got me right back to like okay this is i'm in my own feelings again this isn't someone else's soup that I'm sitting in, someone with a defined solar plexus or whatever. That's been very, that very completely undefined ego. You might not understand. It might threaten, you know, this is a practice <laughs> to do on your own, right? It's not like you're <laughs> like playing poker and then it's like, <laughs> 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 no, I was making a little joke. But um, well, the other thing I was going to say also is um, I've talked a lot about sacral response and I talk with Mark Germain a lot about it because he is all about how the question is phrased. And I do think getting enough information before making the response is nice, like front loading a little bit can be. Mm -hmm. It can also be, I mean, it can, you know, it's not necessary always, but he makes a really big deal about, he will say, well, Jonah, I asked, do you want to do this? But I didn't ask, is it correct for you to do this? Now, I personally do not make a distinction because to me, the two kinds of yes or no questions that I can receive are one where I make a decision. Are we doing this? Which is equivalent to, do you want to do this? Which is equivalent to, let's do this. Which is equivalent to, do this. Someone could literally say, do this. I'm like, uh-uh. You know, if I don't want to. You know, like, it's not even really, it's just like, it's like, is the decision being made? Versus if I ask you, um, now is that the same so you were saying that you're doing, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. is that the same as yes or no? And if I like ask that kind of question, you can like think about it and go like, is it really the same? No, I guess there's a little difference here. Like I'm not really asking, I'm not asking you to make a decision. I'm asking you to share your outer authority about what you possibly see the differences. So I guess what I'm saying mm -hmm. is that there's two kinds of questions. There's inner authority questions and outer authority questions. An outer authority question, even if it's a yes or no question, is basically asking for your opinion, your view, your creativity, your expression, your ideas, your knowledge, your experience, and so on. It's an outer authority question. I'm not asking you to make a decision. But mm -hmm. some people seem to think that every yes or no question that the generator receives 
almost like they're a crystal ball. Like, you know, am I going to win the you know lottery tomorrow? Uh-huh. I got a sacral yes to that. You're going to win, buddy. It's like, no, that's not how it works. <laughs> like, there's no decision. You can't decide for me to win the lottery tomorrow. There's no, you can go, uh-huh, because your sacral's like, oh, cool, lottery. I like that. But it's not really, so that's, I guess, kind of something I've been thinking about is the the the, mm. the sacral is really just responding to things it hears and i also i had this observation yesterday I, I love your your idea on what i just said but also i was realizing um i really don't like having to decide exclusively it's almost like do you want this person to come uh-huh do you want this person to come uh-huh well we only have one space which do you prefer? Mm -hmm. Like, I don't like those, which do you prefer? There's only one space. It's just like, if I want this person to come, uh-huh. Want this person to come, uh-uh. Want this person to come, uh-huh. Like, it's just kind of like, I either do or I don't. And I'm not really like taking into account questions of like, well, you, which one do you want more? I guess what I'm saying is like, if this were like a, like a low level, um, code for like a microprocessor, like for, you know what I mean? Like it would only really have operators for yes or no. It would only really have Booleans. It wouldn't have greater than, less than. Cause I can't really be like, I'm more uh-huh to Sean than I'm uh-huh to Mike. It's just like, you wanna hang out with Sean? Uh-huh, wanna hang out with Mike? Uh-huh. Like, let's bring these guys here, let's hang out. It's not like, well, do you wanna hang out more with Sean than Mike? What does that more even mean? Like more doesn't compute because the sacral is just like, uh-huh. So, I mean, that's kind of, these are just my little, my random thoughts, but I'd love to hear your thoughts on any of that. Um, uh -huh. I guess, yeah, that's kind of where I <laughs> Well, it's interesting because like decisions, I, I definitely, and I've been practicing this a lot with my wife, like yes, no questions, where it really is just yes or no, that's great. And it's, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and she's, she's pretty fast that way too. I find, and maybe it's that 3420, but, if I have to answer yes, my brain's had time to get in the way. Like it's so, it so really for, for you, you really in. are. So that's interesting because I've heard Ross say now he obviously wasn't an MG. He was a manifester. But I've heard him say mm -hmm. that because the 34 connects to the 20, you can immediately say a word like, OK, let's go. OK, let's do it. Let's go. Yes. Uh -huh. Or now. Now I am thinking we should leave. Now let's do this. Now. I mean, it's the voice of the now. Right. So. But you're saying mm -hmm. in that case, it's not actually true for you. Or if you do say a word, it could be, it's, it's almost like if maybe because it's unconscious for you too, I wonder if, I wonder if maybe um, with this unconscious 20, if you catch yourself saying something that it's kind of like it got past the security guard of the mind, like you caught yourself saying it. In a way, whereas if I, I say, do you want to do this? And you're like, yes, let's do it. That could be the undefined solar plexus being like, I don't want to hurt Jonah's feelings. Right? Yeah. A little bit well, I count. So I count like, yeah. So decisions. Uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. If it's I'm being asked my opinion, which is what you're talking about, I will count to one. Like I will purposely count to one. And I learned that from a, my friend Jeff, who was talking about like hitting a baseball. And he was like, I was always shanking it the wrong way. The one I want to hit, I would say one and then swing. Like, just give me one second to just tap into all my resources. And I do wonder if with my 57 and that spleen, like, I get some hits sometimes. I'm like, oh, no way. And it is unpopular opinion because everyone's else invested time. And I'm just like, fuck no, I am not doing this thing. And then I have to go through this painful ordeal. I have to explain. And people with uh, open or defined solar plexus just can't handle that like they're just like what do you how could you know right now i'm like that i'm not saying it's for you but for me that's a hell fucking no <laughs> and yeah the uh, screen just we don't need to spend any more time it. on this yeah. yeah yeah so decisions fast um opinions hang on a second and then I, i've definitely learned that i if you know if i have something that comes what is it like i i remember or i i can these are words that um yeah i remember it would be inner wisdom and yeah. like i know i can contribute could be eight or i can't contribute or i lead is a funny was, one because who really says i lead but i mean I'm probably like versions of i lead where you're like i'm pointing the way here i'm bringing us here i'm kind of you know leading kind of different versions. i lead or i don't right like i need yeah. to be elected or whatever and 
so my wife has 731 too and <laughs> we've rarely noticed now that she she sees it so we're both got that out al- that's the alpha right so we both got the alpha thing going on i'm a very i'm a particularly strong alpha so she has to pick her spots but what we think is banter in front of people like we'll just be like honestly we just think it's banter it's us just playing and and there's do- a heavy dose of sarcasm that's baked in there after 28 years <laughs> but other people are like whoo it's getting hot in here like should we go take a break and they're just observers to us having banter and everyone else is super uncomfortable and like we'll be fine <laughs> so we're, we're really hyper aware of that now and seeing that real time so it's almost to the point where it's fun but usually it's not <laughs> so i have one uh little thing to share i just wanted to say um i dug this up this is from jan van denberg this is his uh work on on Ra, in memory of Ra Urufu, who brought human design in daylight. And this is by Jan van Denberg. And this is, Jan is one of the- Why does it say in daylight? Sorry, I didn't mean to just the way he put it. it I mean, daylight? he brought it into the light. I mean, I don't know. It's kind of just poetic license, I think. But, um, but Jan is the greatest well, just... biographer. Yeah, it's kind of funny, right? It is. He brought it out of the darkness. I mean, he brought it into the light. It's just kind of brought it into being. Yeah, but he wasn't exactly a ray of sunshine either, right? His <laughs> his filter interpretation well, his name is... is Ra, the sun god. I mean, I don't know. But uh, yeah, it's a good point. <laughs> it's, it's not, a good point. Yeah. So, uh, but, but, I, but I wanted to show that, uh, yeah, I absolutely can confirm you're absolutely right. Montreal... Montreal? Canada, right. April 9th, 1948. That's gate 51, line 5 at midnight and 14 minutes after midnight. And this is actually, um, we see from the Canadian Jewish Review here, uh, born to Mr. and Mrs. Joseph Krakauer, nay yet the Walkman, Glencairn Road, a son, Alan Robert, at the Jewish General Hospital on April 9th, grandson of Mr. and Mrs. Z. Walkman, Wilson Avenue, and of Mrs. C. Krakauer, Jean Mance Street, godparents are Mr. and Mrs. B. Krakauer, Wiseman Avenue. So how cool is that? <laughs> Just Ra's birth birth record in the newspaper right there. And of course, this Yeah, is... can you send that my way? I'd love to skin that. Yeah, thing. absolutely. Awesome. I will. I will. Jan has made this available to share and... Uh, he's a great historian of human design and just an incredible we actually um in our uh we, we have these guidebooks this wonderful guidebook made by Ginny v uh, jennifer vander Heiden for uh for the high desert human design conference last year just an incredible guidebook that was made and all right uh, you know, this was this had our schedule of events and our speakers. I mean, as you can see, um, and I'm so excited you're our guest this year. I can't wait to brainstorm with you what kind of workshops and other things we'll get into. But you can see we had all the speakers and so on. And um, we actually uh, made Jan van Denberg the Human Design Person of the Year. So we actually made a little page oh, nice. for him in the guidebook because he's done so much for human design um you have a little picture of him there so and he is uh, i have no idea what i'm going to speak about so you'll have to <laughs> coach me through well that. that's okay you know you have an undefined head najna you don't really need to and also um we we're doing lectures but we're also doing workshops we're doing experiential things something exciting this year uh, we're going kind of lighter on the lectures. We'll still have talks, but for instance, Mike is going to do a personality Venus workshop like he did for Human Design Catalyst recently, where he'll talk about Venus in your in your chart. Like for instance, um, oh, let me see. Uh, do you do you have yours handy? This one doesn't have the planets, but. Uh, but uh, but in any case, I can find it for you. It, it's okay. I actually I have it. Um, I actually have it. Let me, um, just a second. I have it here because I was doing my good first line homework before you uh, joined. And <laughs> so um, I see that your personality Venus is gate 36, line two. So um, so the way that, so what, just as an example of what a workshop could be like, Mike is going to basically talk about personality Venus, and he kind of has this, I don't want to spoil it too much or give too much away, but he has this really great point. If there's one key takeaway, it's that 
Personality Venus is what your personal standard is, your personal values, like the values of the mind. And it wants to universalize these values and think that everyone should abide by them. But really, that's just your personal values. You know, there's 63 mm -hmm. other kinds of personal values out there too. You know, everyone with Venus in gate 10 thinks people should behave and Venus in gate nine thinks people should focus and, and so on. Um, it'd be interesting. I wonder what Venus in gate 36 is. Is it people, people should be uh, excited for new experience or something like that. But we can see that gate 36 line two is called support, assistance to others in times of decline. So I guess this would be, mm -hmm. People should support others. You know, we, it's that, and it's the application of imagination to schemes which benefit others, feelings that can benefit others, uh, or selective assistance to others during times of crisis. So it's kind of a personal value that, you know, you yourself have this great potential of using your, your you know, imagination. When there's a crisis, you can think up ways to solve it. Oh, there's not enough of something. Mm -hmm. Let's find a way to make there be enough. People are having a hard time. Let's find a way out of this. Let's assist people. Let's mm -hmm. use our imagination to be creative and to assist and to support. But, you know, if that's a, uh, to generalize that is like everyone should support in a time of crisis. Everyone should be imaginative. What's wrong with them that they're, they can't think of, something that would help in this and so on. So, I mean, there's obviously more to it than that, but just as an example of his workshop, um, you know, it'll probably be max 10, maybe 12 people because we have a, a main venue and a main stage where the lectures will be to an audience of up to 100. It's actually, uh, we will have, you know, 100 people in attendance. These are big lectures, 50 minutes, some of them, and then some of them will be 80 minutes, but we're trying to, we're encouraging the shorter format. Uh, Cause when you have that many people and you know, it's just kind of nice to keep it like that. And we're doing a few of these, but really this year we're trying to make it more intimate. We're trying to make it more hands-on and have more connection and more small group connections. So we actually have a number of venues. We have the Center for Human Design here, which is my home and we have a few rooms here. We also have Fasciation Space, which is this retail space run by my friend Mike, friend and colleague. And then we have a few other venues around town. Um, a man named Robert Ray, who's an incredible mystic, has actually donated uh, some of his space at Ray's Country Garden, his farm and B&B. So he'll be hosting workshops. We have a um, Romy and Amy Evans, who will be donating some of their space for workshops and so on. So we have these really great venues around town. And so, yeah, we'll, we'll chat about it offline, but just, you know, know that um, we really do have a lot of options. And that I guess if there is a focus this year, it's on intimate, experiential, hands-on and so that's why it's really cool for mike for instance doing this personality venus workshop where he actually will get everyone's charts and will have time to go through their charts unlike on a big stage where you kind of just have to talk at the audience so i i'd love to like conduct some experiments have you seen that uh, video of richard Beaumont when he's in like in the british countryside and he's inside a tent and he actually has a whole bunch of people with their charts and he gets them to divide themselves up so he has all the, the uh, manifestors in one section, all the oh, we, uh, generators, we do that every all the projectors. Year. And if you'd like to lead yeah. one of those, you absolutely can. Um, we're hoping. Well, I don't know if I can, but. So no, you, well, you absolutely can. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, it, that, that was your 8-1 <laughs> talking. I don't know if I can contribute. <laughs> so, but, um, so we had St Stephen Rebolito do it last year, and then we did some of our own aura experiments the year before. Um, that first year we did a really fun one where we had a room full of generators and manifesting generators and we would send a single generator into the room of projectors. And that single generator would pick a projector, tell them to go back into the generator room. And then we'd have the projector in a room of generators and a generator in a room, in a, or an MG, you know, in the room of projectors. And they would spend five or 10 minutes and then pick one person each and trade off and pick one and pick one. And we did that for a couple hours. And so the generators got to experience what it's like to be the only generator in a room full of projectors. You walk in, 
everyone turns. It's like this, like the light, it's like <laughs> all the spotlights look at you all at once, you know, and it wasn't quite the same for the projectors going to the generator room. But we had Stephen Rebolito last year and I'm hoping he'll join this year again. Uh, we're really trying to get him out here because he's just absolutely wonderful and a great speaker and a great, great organizer and host facilitator hmm. and uh and he did some stuff like that like what you're talking about where he would have everyone with a defined root one side of the room undefined root the other side the undefined root are squirming and dancing and they got you know <laughs> hot pants and the you know defined root are just kind of standing there just kind of imposing <laughs> or he would get uh, all the defined solar plexus on one side undefined on the other and he did that with with a lot of different combinations so yeah, we're going to definitely have some experiential sort of aura experiments. We're going to have, um, yeah, really it's it's just kind of, the, the, the goal is just we want to make it educational as it is every year, but we also want to temper the educational content with networking opportunities. So there'll be a lot of just hanging out and meeting people. And then with sort of more intensive workshops where you get to really go deep with your chart. Ideally, everyone who comes will have multiple opportunities even every day to go into their chart in different workshops so they can really learn mm -hmm. a lot working with their own chart. So we're really excited and it's um, it's going to be a great, great event. And uh, maybe I'll just this would be a good time, actually. Um, I don't can know. I... Have you seen the 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 uh, site yet? We have a website we've created. Uh, no, no, uh, me, so you want to share is, earlier? Yeah, no, so this I'm is high desert com. It actually, it's it just redirects, but this is high desert human design, and we actually have a new edition, which is pretty exciting. We have a number of new editions, but mm -hmm. um, I might see my name on there. That's hilarious. <laughs> your name is on here, yeah, there you yeah. are, and I know uh, Adrienne. Yeah, Adrienne Roach, uh, Roach is wonderful. She's connected. one of the most recent additions. And then today we have Alokanand Diaz and Jakob Strzeski, um, who are going to be joining remotely. And we're very excited to have them as remote speakers. As you can see, we have quite a full roster. Mm. Um, so excited. This is Robert Ray, who will be hosting some at his country garden. Cool. Uh, I see uh, um, Amy Lee and John Cole there. Yeah, so, um, absolutely. I I attended their rave cartography course. Oh, they're there. And it was wonderful. almost it was almost entirely projectors in that course. So it was a Zoom call. And so it was me and uh, a manifester and another MG, but there was like I don't know, twelve or fifteen projectors. And I was just ant in my pants wanting to speak up and they're all just quietly consuming. It was I well, you have those that. four those four channels from the G center to the throat. <laughs> We're very excited. We have two luminaries um, of human design who have just agreed to join today as a remote. Mm -hmm. uh, they're they're going to be on Zoom or on you know they'll they'll just be calling in, but we'll have uh, have them on on the projector and speakers and doing a talk for <laughs> attendees, which is a really special opportunity. I have a note on the schedule there, but yeah, really excited to have you. This was a fun picture I, I you know, found of you. I really like that picture. Mm -hmm. um, Primo Hawk, but yep, basically yeah. still me. <laughs> well, if you want to, if you want to update the picture, we can always get an updated one. Yeah. But, you know, I have a drum kit here, and that's the other thing is uh, I'm hoping to, you know, we, we always do educational stuff. I'm trying to just make it. Some of the funnest times we've had in the previous events have been the more experiential, like we did. Mm -hmm human design trivia last time and it was myself on piano and Dave Myers on drums and he was also you know announcing and we would play in between or we would kind of give the trivia the teams would all talk it over and we'd, we'd jam out a little bit while they're all talking it over and um, I'm hoping that he will join as well uh, this this year we're excited uh, we're in talks I should say so it feels like wonder, being some like Hollywood mogul who's like trying to get all these celebrities to be a part of the film or something. That's what it feels like being me getting this. Done, you know? <laughs> and like we, we almost have Dave, you know, or, you know, fingers crossed we're going to get him this year. So that's cool. Well, if you want me, uh, I could donate a copy of uh, or use of the music bingo thing we've got. There might be a way to, to turn that into a bit of an icebreaker game and or. Bingo translates to a lot of different things, like even training and or recognition. Oh, so that'd be wonderful. That'd be wonderful. You know, the, I have uh, actually just, I was looking through them again because I was trying to make some new, some new uh, trivia. 
we have trivia from last year. These are all my trivia notes. And we even have like, you know, uh, what animal does the website 64 Keys call the quad left? What channel is said to make oh. you have to pee? You don't have to answer these unless you want to. No, it's it's the shark. Yes. And, Dang, uh, you're good. Okay. Because, well, because, the, because I'm a quad left. But, and in the channel that is said to make you have to pee, have you heard this one? No. The 3740, because it's uh, it works on the stomach and the bladder. So if, you, you know, if you're an undefined solar plexus like us, you hang out with the 3740, it's like, ooh, I got I to gotta go to the bathroom. <laughs> that's interesting because I, well, that's where I was at the hospital today is I've had a urinary tract infection for years, as a, and which is very rare for a male, and uh, got scoped and all that. But I have tapped, I, I can, I used to get it for weeks, and then when I kind of went into the metaphysical of that and, and bladder incontinence and stuff, I'm, I'm way oversharing, but I tend to. Um, but as soon as I ripped that open the book, my uh, UTI went away in about three hours because I actually like recognized the stress that was tied to it. So I went and had a scope yesterday. And it turns out there is a little bit of a, an issue that dates back to me having diverticulosis. And so it's something they can fix, but it was such a small thing that it was getting aggravated by stress. And, I and I'd be willing say. to bet that. Oh, you got it. So much for introducing me to this book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. This is I've like I'm using it sparingly because each time I open it, I get so much out of it, and there's just so much to process, and it is incredible. And I've already used it with a friend, and it's amazing. It's really good. So yeah, I, I introduced. I was amazed that everyone on my hypnosis course had never heard of it, and yet these are people healing well, people and talking them through ailments and this is the questions that ask yeah. you know, the kind of things you would ask in a session of hypnosis before you it, it's incredible it, right? and i've also been reading um this which is a much smaller book and this is the mm. other one i picked up which just kind of talks about some of the technique and some of what went into it and it's incredible mm. i am i am so blown away by that so yeah well i would love to um use your software and also have you on drums and Think of some fun entertainment things we can do. Maybe we could come up with some of this trivia uh, together because I need some new trivia questions if you'd be interested in hosting it or we might get mm. Dave to host it again if he comes back out. He's also written a bunch of human design songs and I'm really excited for him to perform them here. So, you know, again, fingers crossed. Um, but it's just really shaping up and, uh, you know, again, I'm just so glad you will be a part of it. As you can see, we have... I think we're up to, I don't know, 30, 31 speakers. I mean, it's it's pretty great. So, and when I say speakers, I mean, it, these won't all be lectures. They'll be a combination of lectures and workshops and experiential. Um, it, it's going to be all over the place. So there's going to be a lot mm. of really interesting things to do. I know uh, Brandy Jordan and Danny Kilpatrick, they're going to be hosting um, a really special RSVP only event. So we have this main venue, uh, which can fit, you know, 100 people and is a really great venue. And then we're also using these smaller venues, so th those will be RSVP only events. And uh, so there's some really special things in store. And so stay tuned and I'll be, uh, I'll be emailing you and everyone else who's you know, going to be on, on the list this year. Um, and for anyone who is not has not yet bought tickets, please check the site. Uh, I actually had to put a little note because we are getting right. I put the note today, low ticket warning. We will be closing sales soon. So make sure mm -hmm. if you want to come, um, you know, I don't think we're going to get to the, to the regular price. We're, we're selling out an early bird this year, it yeah. looks like. So, uh, which is totally fine. We're just happy folks can come. So we mm. might release more tickets later if we have any cancellations and those will be at the at the regular price but um yeah if if anyone's watching and they want to come get your tickets now because they're almost out so you might need a bigger boat i think there's a bit of a renaissance or not a renaissance there's a bit of a i don't know maybe it's just like no i'm Tesla, I was thinking about everywhere, but this year like upping the cap to 150 um, mm -hmm. because we've already, it was so quick this year. I mean, we announced the lineup a couple days ago and we're almost sold out. We did have mm -hmm. early bird ticket sales about a month ago, um, but we didn't do any announcements at all. I mean, I think I just verbally word of mouth told a few people, uh, we did a minor announcement. I think I might've posted once on Instagram or something, but 
I mean, this is with zero promotion. We're just going through such an incredible time um, in human design. And I just feel so lucky to have so many, so much great support. I mean, so many people like yourself and the other speakers and other organizers and crew. And um, yeah, it's been really, really wonderful. And I'm not going to make it into an Oscar speech, but <laughs> I'll save that for the, for the closing night. Um, but yeah, it's just going to be great. I'm so excited you're coming and it's really you thought about streaming it. You know, we streamed it last year and we might, the only thing is it's such an incredible event. We definitely record it. So it'll all be recorded. Mm -hmm. It'll all get online later. The difficulty with streaming is that it takes humans away from other things they could be doing, like enjoying themselves. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it required such an investment. I have to see if we have any humans who want to be committed to running all that stuff. If so, streaming might happen again. And uh, it was a huge success last year. Everyone loved loved the streaming. And we've had a lot of requests for streaming again. It was just that it limited us in some ways compared to the first year that we didn't stream, we only recorded. So either way, it's all getting recorded. Either way, it's all getting uploaded. People will get to watch a bunch of talks. They're going to get a bunch of content. I'm actually in the process right now of editing some of the talks from last year that haven't been uploaded yet. And I'll be you know, releasing those in this, in this kind of run up. So either way, folks who don't get to come are going to get some of the content. But um, yeah, I mean, I would love to stream. If we have the resources, that's definitely a possibility. And uh, especially for the two Zoom talks, we've never done any, any remote speakers before. So we have mm -hmm. two speakers who are going to be remote this time. And typically we wouldn't want remote speakers because, you know, we're all on our screen so much anyway. This gives us a chance to all meet in person and communicate in person. But we couldn't turn down the opportunity to have two living legends of human design connect. Um, you know, Elokanan Diaz has been in human design 31 years, transcribed the works of Ra for 18 years. It's just one of the most brilliant human design analysts in the world. And has such an incredible, unique knowledge. Um, I could listen to him talk for hours. His book, The 64 Gates Through the Rave Mandala, is just incredible. And uh, this is this is him, so kind of fun. But uh, I've listened to some of his his stuff. I can't imagine what like what's that four seven fourteen twenty eight uh, at least four deconditioning cycles, right? And so even oh. just. He's just fantastic, See. and uh, I could listen to him talk for hours. I've been very lucky to have developed a personal and professional relationship with him, so mm -hmm. I get a lot of treats of getting to communicate with him. And then we have other surprise guests I'm not going to mention, who I, I don't think will be doing talks, but will be present, who are also kind of luminaries in the field and uh, are in the 20, 25 year plus club. So I can't really announce them, but uh, we'll be brushing shoulders with some human design royalty. And then, uh, <laughs> and then Jakob is just incredible, and he's he's done three thousand five hundred readings. He's been in, you know, he's done, taught so many classes. He's just so so eloquent and great. He's kind of one of the main folks over at Human Design America, along with Genoa Blyven, and um, yeah. really excited to have him. Uh, join us even though it's going to be on zoom it's going to be worth it you know and so for those i think would be easier to stream since we're already kind of set up anyway in the, in, the, in the digital realm so we'll see how that goes but then obviously some of the other things like we're going to have visits to Ten Thousand waves which is a japanese spa where they donate uh, we, we know someone there who actually donates two trips per event so at our spring event, we had two trips there. At our winter event, we had trips. And so this time we have two nights where we'll be bringing groups. That's one not to miss. Definitely RSVP to that when it, uh, when it, when it goes out. And, um, but, you know, it's going to be hard. We can't really stream that because it's a visit to a you know, Japanese spa. So <laughs> it would be fun to stream from the sauna. We may <laughs> record from the sauna. We'll, we'll see, you know. Um, but we're going to do that. I know uh, Melissa Murray is going to be taking people on a hike, which is, which will be nice. Kind of, we have really beautiful hiking around here. And uh, yeah, we've been trying to think outside of the box. The last two years, we've done environment walks, and those have been really fun. I've led them, but maybe somebody else will be into it this year. But basically, we have a list of destinations. So I took them 
kind of to a really busy kitchen where I, you know, know the chef to hang out for a little bit for kitchens. Or I took them uh, right up to a mm. nice mountain peak around the area with a really beautiful view for the mountains. And we kind of just do this, you know, environment walk where we go through different environments um, and then talk about them. So mm -hmm. environments are super interesting. That's something I've been experimenting with with friends and asking questions. Those cave environments and just asking about why they picked where they sat. Like, are you checking for the exits? And um, I have a friend who's mountains. Yeah. I mean, he lives in Missouri where there isn't a lot of scuba diving, but he loves to scuba dive. And I guess it's because he really needs that lack of oxygen. And he just, yeah, loves. I've heard. And so I he smokes. Really scuba diving, but I've heard that. And that's something Ross said as well is that mountains people like scuba diving, which is such a funny, it's like, who would have thunk? I'm mountains. So maybe I should try it. Well, it's the lack of oxygen that just gives you that zen, that, that quiet that you're, you think at your best. And so this you're either going to use like smoking the, to do that or. Well, and you're, yeah, and I quit smoking now. So this must be why I like. Buteco breathing, which I mentioned last time, which is, uh, there was a really funny uh, comment on, you know, YouTube, I was actually describing uh, Buteco breathing last time. And I said, you just breathe quietly through your nose. And the comment was, Jonah, that's not a special breathing technique. That's just called breathing. <laughs> so just I called don't breathing. know what your definition of breathing is, but that's just breathing. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> ah. well, okay. Cool. I have one last, uh, one last thing. And then I think we can kind of wrap up or we could also save this for next time. Cause it's seems like we just have an endless plethora of topics. So my last note here was, and you can just tell me if you have enough energy to go into this light okay. codes, lightning. Mm. Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, this is my interpretation, right? And so I was experimenting with it. First, I thought I was nuts listening to this stuff. So there's a bunch of uh, YouTube videos and folks doing it. And uh, I tried it a couple times and felt a sensation in my body as I let my body listen to it. So it's not my ears necessarily. It's just that the this um, light language, usually it's people using their hands and or it's a combination of that and sounds. And they, they sound like they're speaking some foreign language. But... Um, most of them provide a description of what they channeled when they, they brought this light language. And the way I liken it is that they're speaking a tongue that was from a different time that my body, my DNA, my genetic meat suit understands, but my ear doesn't. And so, uh, and I also actually got to the point where I listen to it on double speed, like I'm in the matrix, because I realized that the intonation and their voice has nothing to do with it. It's just the message. So I'll just sit there and, and let it go in the background. And there's some for like healing the room, healing you, healing your pets. Um, it's, it's very interesting. And I, I, first I was just like, this is nuts. I mean, this is, there's nothing to this, but there is something to it. And uh, I've been experimenting in a bunch of ways. One was I'm still trying to understand the dream rave and, you know, when I sleep and why I was waking up the way I did. And I read somewhere that, you know, you're basically um, trying to remember who you are in the morning. And so, um, yeah, I made a, basically a YouTube playlist where I have a 30 minute yoga nidra where I just go into sleep. And then I went and looked at all of this, my states or whatever demon realm and stuff, and kind of tried to find a light language that combated whatever I would be going through while I'm sleeping. Um, so I was trying to like find light language that aligned with that. Then I also went for my genetic trauma, shame, and I went for my fears and found light language to address those. And so I would basically go to sleep, get lulled into sleep by yoga nidra, then let all this light language play while I'm sleeping. And then usually would leave it with some sort of energy healing music, like going through the chakras or something, right? Pick some frequency. And I would wake up in the morning completely chill, calm. I, I actually woke up not kind of being like, where the fuck am I? Who am I? Like I actually woke up. Oh, and I had affirmations in there as well. So affirmations for manifest and gender, man, affirmations for um, a three, five to basically like when I came back online, I didn't have to kind of figure out who I was. I was like feeding it to myself. So I've been experimenting with that. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know if it works, except that I think it works. So, and part well, of me is like, incredible. <laughs> I did not know what that was at all. I mean, when, when I heard light language, I was thinking like um, communicating with light, but these are actually like, verbal languages but it's like angelic language almost or it's yeah like and it's channeled by other people so there's one guy his name is nick i actually had a like i had a session with him by a zoom call and he channeled something specific for me and there's another woman that's um 
her she sounds like a dolphin when she's doing it so it's you know you're kind of like was anyone looking when i'm doing this right like it's very, one of those things yeah what's but, sean doing today put on the headphones and it's uh <laughs> yeah it's better in the headphones right um i get some looks but there is something to it and I, and honestly i don't care part of it's like even if it's a placebo effect of just like i want to improve in these areas just accept that that and that's kind of the hypnosis thing too right and tapping and affirmative reinforcement so if my meat sack is just sitting there listening to this shit while i'm sleeping and i'm trying to tap out i'm like well i'm just getting work while i'm done and part of that came from i was looking into like can i learn while i sleep right i, I really am addicted to knowledge lately and sapping it up and uh started looking in and the one thing I read is that you can't really learn much while you sleep, but languages you can. And so if you go looking on YouTube, you can learn Italian while you sleep. You can learn French while you sleep. I don't know if that's working for anyone else. I didn't really spend a lot of time there, but that did make me think like if, if my body can hear the tones, recognize the tones, become comfortable with the tones. And I know that my subconscious is actually kind of online and taking it in. It's like, what the hell? try it. So I've been doing that. I've been sharing so usually when someone says, I got a sore shoulder, I go and look in the metaphysical anatomy book, look at the sho sore shoulder, then usually whatever trauma it's tied to, I will send them a light language related to that trauma mm -hmm. and just say, listen to this. And so the combination of that bit of recon from the book, plus a light language that's speaking to your meat sack. And, and again, a lot of these light languages, well, there's one lady, her stuff is amazing, but it's LNL something. Um, in the description, she'll actually write out what she channeled like she understood it and will write out basically what it was and it's really deep insightful stuff like she'll be talking about shame and it's it's amazing what she's writing she's either an expert on everything or she's channeled this stuff did her clucking and ticking and stuff <laughs> and then uh, usually she draws it and she provides a description so i even find just listening to it and reading it is reinforcing i don't know the positive vibes that it's meant to give so and you know what it doesn't hurt but while you're just chilling out so you can play a video game and you know instead of listening to music you just let that go in the background and i'm not paying attention to it i'm not worrying about whether i understand it i just let the meat sack soak it in so let the meat sack soak it in that's the quote of the day <laughs> put that well, on a shirt you, <laughs> thank you so much sean i'm definitely uh let the meat sack soak it in that'll be a good uh a good closing thought i think that's a good summary of a lot of things that that are beneficial to us so it's been an absolute joy having you and um yeah man good talking thank you any uh any final parting shots parting shout outs i know you've been doing some videos where can people check out your work uh i, I need to do more actually it's on my mind yeah, remind me because i need to be nudged for some reason i won't do it myself uh i have a youtube channel it's called just shining around um or my website brainlitter.com has got links and stuff to where people can find me so yeah, and I have the link on the highdeserthumandesign.com website. Uh, if you click on Sean Walbridge, it does it does take you to brainlitter.com. Um, and yeah, if you look up just shining around, uh, great name by the way. Which so uh, that came from uh, a bunch of guys I met through a medicine weekend, but they were on a beach and they were all on LSD and they were watching a, like they were sort of super high and saw a bear. It walked right into their camp. And they should have been freaking out. But instead, this bear was just like pawing at a fish. And they're like, oh, that bear's just bearing around, right? And when I heard that, I was like, that sounds like a great way to lead my life. Like, and especially maybe it's being in alignment or it's just letting, like being a passenger. I'm just, I don't know. It's Sean is like in front of me. He's just going around doing his thing. And I'm kind of observing and kind of watching it. I am kind of watching a movie lately. It's kind of funny. So... <laughs> wonderful wonderful well uh i look forward to catching more of your videos and doing more collabs with you and i uh, can't wait to meet in aura this september in santa fe so mm -hmm. really looking awesome, forward man. to it that was fun thanks <laughs> talk to you soon <laughs> it was really fun hanging i had a blast see you man okay Bye, later.